everybody. We'll give everybody a minute to join us. And as you join us in the chat box, please let us know where you're from and, and who you are um, joining in this webinar with us. Welcome, great to see everybody. Welcome back, fabulous to have you all. And the chat is getting active. If you're on Facebook Live or on Zoom, feel free to participate, whatever is easiest for you. Got folks from Canada, California, Missouri, Elk Grove, California, Colorado, Ohio, Texas, Colorado, Massachusetts. Oh my gosh, you all, this is chat is flying by. Yes. Japan, I saw Japan. Say again, Zaretta. I saw Japan. Yes, we have following uh -huh. Japan. Excellent. We had about 1,200 people register for the event. So we're just going to wait one more minute because I see about 500 are in so far. We usually don't get everybody able to show up for it. Um, Absolutely. But as we're, as we're letting everybody introduce themselves, I, well, maybe I'll, I'm just going to wait one more minute. Taking a, take a breath here and yes. just feel the appreciation for everybody joining together. I don't want to wait too long though, because we do want to get all of our time with um, Zaretta and Toby today. So uh, let me start by introducing myself. I am Tracy Heilers. I'm founder and executive director of the Coalition of Schools Educating Mindfully, sometimes called COSM. And so COSM has been uh, around two years. So if you hadn't never heard of us before, that's why you uh, were a fairly new nonprofit organization. And what we do is support school communities in a variety of ways, including um, providing educators with resources, trainings, mentors. Uh, we have currently 28 US states represented with chapters. Uh, so some of those chapters are just getting started and have had in-person meetings throughout uh, the school year. So we uh, definitely encourage everyone to check out our website at educatingmindfully.org to find out more about, more about us. Um, how the webinar will work today we're going to um, first hear from Tovi, have a mindful moment. She'll introduce Zaretta, who many of you know already. Um, and then after they have a discussion, we'll take some Q&A. And to do that, you'll just click the, where it says Q&A. Um, you can also, at that time when we're taking Q&A, you could click the um, raise, I'm looking to see if we have it, the raise hand button. Um, that's another way to do it as well. And we'll um, prioritize questions. If someone's raised their hand, they will have priority over the other um, Q&A. Um, one thing that we've added for this webinar is closed captioning. And we haven't tried that before. So if you'd like that option, click there and we'll see if it works. Oh, it's working on my screen. So that's great. Um, and uh, I think that's it for the for the formatting, but I want to introduce Tony Scruggs Hussein, who is our president extraordinaire. She is an expert in so many things, including um, race, she has a racial healing allies course going right now with uh, two other COSM members. Um, she is an expert in trauma informed learning, emotional intelligence, using mindfulness as an equity tool. So I encourage you to go to her website, tcs.com, to find out more about her, t-i-c-i-e-s-s.com. Uh, so Toby, why don't you take it away? Thank you so much, Tracy. Welcome, everyone. There's almost 600 of you here. And thank you, Zaretta, for gracing us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, in traditional COSM fashion, Folks, we're going to take a moment to be mindful. So if we can just center ourselves for a moment, that will be lovely. Look at this lovely young African-American boy getting his mindful moment. And we'll just close our eyes for a moment and take three deep breaths.
I'm going to read a short quote from Zaretta's book. Culture is the widening of the mind and of the spirit by Brother Nehru, the first prime minister of India. And let us just be with that quote for one moment. Culture is the widening of the mind and of the spirit. All right, everyone. So we have the esteemed Zaretta Hammond here with us today. She is a national consultant and the author of Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain, Promoting Authentic Engagement and Rigor for Culturally and Linguistically Diverse Students. She is a former high school and community college expository writing instructor who is passionate and beyond passionate, well-skilled, about the intersection of literacy, equity, and neuroscience. She has published articles in Educational Leadership, The Learning Professional, and Phi Delta Kappen. So thank you, Zaretta, for being here with us. You're mute. Thank you. I do that all the time. Too, Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here and to be able to talk about how these two really important things come together and just to be in conversation with you all, um, you know, here on the webinar, but also everybody out there and because we're all in it together trying to figure this out uh, in service of our children and our families. So I just appreciate you all spending some time with us this afternoon. Absolutely. Thank you. We have a traditional question because we want to normalize mindfulness. We want to normalize the act of meditating and having a personal mindfulness practice. So um, could you share with us a little bit about either your mindfulness practice or self-care? How are you resourcing yourself at this time? And what is it? Absolutely. Like? It, you know, and I've been doing um, some type of centering mindfulness every morning. I get up around 4.30 in the morning um, and preferably when it's still dark, I have an opportunity to literally be in the dark. My mindfulness practice is to just be able to center myself and be an open channel so that I can hear what my spirit needs. I can hear what the divine is trying to tell me. I can actually be a conduit in a way that um, allows me to you know, release whatever needs to be released. I usually read some type of spiritual word or passage, maybe a poem. I listen to music that grounds me. Um, you know, I call it get my mind right time. <laughs> you know, and when my children were growing up, you know, they're grown people now, 23 and 29. They knew mama, this mama's dark time. <laughs> we're not going to don't disturb her right now, right? Because mama don't have her dark time. Ain't nothing gonna be right the rest of the morning. But I find because the work is so arduous, right? And, and not just physically, but on our spirits and on our bodies, right? So it, it, as a quick aside, during this pandemic, we know that black and brown bodies are being affected more. And it's because we live in a constant state of heightened cortisol. And that heightened cortisol uh, uh, dampens and compromises the immune system. So being able to have a practice that allows me to release that is really important. I have one at the beginning of the day, sitting in the dark, listening to music, getting my mind recentered on what is important, what I feel like my mission is, divine mission is. And at the end of the day, I try to put my feet in some grass and kind of release that tension and have some way that I can remember. And when things are just going sideways, I just have gratitude. Here are the five things I'm grateful for. Sometimes there's no more than my knees work today. And <laughs> <laughs> right? Just to, like my lungs are clear. And sometimes just to re-anchor in that. Uh, and just remembering ancestors, bringing those into the practice. What do they need to tell me? What do I need to remember? Um, 
yeah, so that is that is a practice that I've carried on probably for the the last um, uh, 29, 29 years. That is absolutely beautiful. And really what you've captured too are examples of what we really talk about when we mean mindful leadership. And you know, the, those are those the small parts of how really impactful thought leaders and authors and artists and teachers begin their days in that time because we know that this work is a calling. That's right. As well. So there's guidance that we have to really tap into. And so um, without taking all the, you know, intellectual parts of it, there's like really that groundedness of gratitude and connecting to the ancestors and having that quiet time. So thank you for sharing in such detail your, your very private practice with us. Thank you. You're very welcome. So about your work in this fabulous book, what is the connection really between um, culturally responsive teaching and the brain as it relates to SEL, social emotional learning? Well, I think the biggest challenge is kind of even the way the mental models we hold around both of those things. And, you know, the idea that we don't recognize the science of learning, that emotions are as critical to learning as the cognitive parts of learning. And so we need to be able to see this as an integrated whole and not, you know, kind of reduce them to kind of just the technical pieces. This is my biggest fear for how we've seen, you know, SEL rolled out in most schools, right? You're not gonna find SEL in a binder, can't purchase it from a publisher, right? We're doing our SEL. I'm like, hmm, can you just actually be with the child when the child needs you to be with them? right? Or is it in that 15 minutes? It's SEL time. So I think there's a way in which we've kind of made it this thing versus kind of an interaction between reconnecting to our humanness and seeing the human uh, connection with another. I call this humanizing our relationships. Mm -hmm. So SEL is the conduit, right? Because we know that if you don't have that sense of connection, then cortisol won't be low enough for you to actually be primed for learning. And it's not a technical thing. And, and different cultures come to that in different ways, right? And it's not just, oh, it's collectivist culture or individualistic culture, that even in collectivist cultures, there are nuances, right? I work with a um, group that has large number of Native Alaskan um, or Alaska Native uh, folks in, Juno. And this is the very thing that we took, how they show up is very different than what kind of Western individualistic oriented and, and they are Americans, <laughs> right? So there are other ways. It's very different from my African American collectivist culture. So the, the more we can widen our aperture to have a bicultural lens to see the different ways mindfulness shows up, the different ways that we practice that. Some people practice, practice that through trance dancing. Some people practice that through kind of interactive. It's much louder. It's not sitting in own position, right? That's a, a one way of doing that. So I think being able to be open to the expressions of that humanizing connection, that grounding connection is a really important thing. And you're not going to find that in a binder that, you know, the publisher pulled together. True that. True <laughs> that. <laughs> so what are some ways you, you're, you keep bringing up cortisol? And so I'm not going to take for granted that everyone knows what that is. So can you just extrapolate a little bit on what is cortisol, the power of it, and why you are anchoring to that as something really important to to mitigate the amount of release well, of it. I got some slides if you want me to show you some slides, right? Well, let's just jump in then. Let's just jump into the slides. Absolutely. Because listen, I don't go anywhere without my slides. We all have to... Here we go. So what I want to be able to kind of talk about, not so much a distance learning, I'll make that connection before we get out of, uh, um, you know, our time together this webinar, but I want to help us think about how will we disrupt the ways in which we have set up classrooms and dehumanize classrooms, not in the sense that we're being ne negative or, or, or mean to children, 
but the ways in which we are overly in the technical part. So, right, this connection to the brain chemistry is so important. So thinking about what do we need to rethink and reinvent and reposition as we think about this. So culturally responsive practice that leads to deep learning has two parts to it. The high trust, low stress environment, I'm going to talk about kind of the three components uh, uh, that, that are related to that so that students can actually do kind of productive struggle, engage in grappling. And that grappling is really important because it actually grows brain power so that you actually start to process information differently because you are taking it apart and putting it together. And you can uncouple the fact that this is some, the fact that you might struggle is a negative thing, right? I'm not talking about struggling that is destructive. I'm talking about the kind of productive struggle that all children, when they're engaged in play, you see them. That all adults learning to play the guitar, right? If you're not good at it, right? That you're just learning to bake and your family eats those first cakes that you bake and you just know they are not tasty. But we all have to go through that. And that's the part of getting better. But if we have a tr high trust, low stress environment, we fail fast through that. And that that actually gives us information. And that actually builds our confidence. And what's really important is confidence precedes confidence. And there's a way in which we want SEL to be about boosting kids' confidence and their belief in themselves. Well, the way that they believe in themselves is by the fact that they can actually do some things. So when we start to talk about what needs to happen creating healthy, sustaining learning environments, designing learning experiences for access and agency. So that's a place where the student can actually grow their brain power, facilitating cognitively demanding tasks and assessing for learning by giving students feedback. But this, it's this first piece, I think it is where SEL lives. And it's a really important piece because as adults, we create that climate in the classroom. And I love this quote. Um, I've come to a frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element in the classroom. It is my personal approach that creates the climate. It's my daily mood that makes the weather. As a teacher, I possess a tremendous power to make a child's life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or heal. In all situations, it is my response that dictates whether a crisis will be escalated or de-escalated, a child humanized or dehumanized. And I think this is so important in all aspects of that, right? How do we build trust such that we can build a community of learners and those learners can help us maintain the integrity of the learning environment? And one of the things that's really important is this then minimizes kind of the, the classroom management issues that people will, will have. And so when you talk about cortisol, this is a piece I think is so important. And I call this, this is your brain on trust, right? These are three systems in our um, nervous system, right? And it, they're really important. They're actually subsystems because we have one ner nervous system that interacts. But each one has um, kind of its own autonomous way of functioning, and it's important to understand the role they play in SEL and the integration with learning. So the first is that cortisol, right? So this is our sympathetic nervous system, and it is the stuff we run away from. We have an amygdala. The amygdala tells us that, oh, it's, you know, something bad is happening. It's got a partner, the reticular activating system, RAS for short, and it's either going to tell you to fight, flight, freeze, or appease, right? And it gets to control the rest of your system. So what's really challenging about that cortisol is it has permission from the amygdala to shut down every other system. And cortisol has a half-life of about three hours, meaning that prefrontal cortex where the higher order thinking happens, where we're learning, it gets consolidated, where we're doing that kind of stuff is non-functional for th those three hours. And if you are trauma sensitive, it can be up to six. That's all day. So being able to understand how you keep the 
cortisol in check is really an important thing, but we can't spend all day like hunting for cortisol fires and putting them out. So the more we understand how our system works, right, that high trust, low stress environment we want to create is really important. So the second one that I think has a lot of important prompts, particularly as we're going to distance learning or some hybrid combination of that is dopamine. Right, so how do you actually help students want to do the hard things, whether that is be part of a community and self-manage in terms of classroom management, or whether it's learn hard things when they are feeling stretched and having some emotion behind that. So think of cortisol, uh, dopamine this way. You're coming off a roller coaster and you've got to decide how you feel about that. Dopamine is the hit you get when you're like the girl in the white jacket. She's like, woohoo, this was scary as hell, but I think I like it. And her brain is listening and it codes that experience with dopamine. So that now every time she thinks about a roller coaster, she wants to go and find one, get on it. It's bringing a very positive emotion to her. Same experience, the guy in the green shirt is not having it. He's like, that was scary as hell and I don't ever wanna go again. His brain is listening and codes that experience with cortisol. Now, every time he thinks about a uh, roller coaster, he's got the heebie-jeebies. So now we have to translate that to thinking about what is happening in the classroom. When you look into your classroom, this is what the SEL programs don't teach you. You have to be able to ascertain, is the cortisol high and how do I bring that down? We still have to teach, and so how do we do that? This is where the polyvagal comes in, and it's one we don't talk about a lot. The vagus nerve is the only one that comes out of the brainstem, but does not go into the spinal column like the other two. Instead, it goes into the stomach. So you have almost as many neurons in your stomach and your gut, right? That's why we talk about a gut reaction or my intuition is somewhere in, in, in my torso. It's because of that polyvagal. And it's poly because that vagus nerve starts to branch off like little fingers around our necks and our upper back and our upper arm. So this is why the universal sign for calming someone down is kind of like rubbing their back, whether we do that to a baby or an accident victim that we're consoling on the sidewalk. That oxytocin that's released is the only thing outside of time and exercise that will start to cut that cortisol. So the question is, if we want students to be learning at high levels, how do we make sure we up the oxytocin? And then nature will take its course by lowering the cortisol. Mm. Instead, what we have a tendency to do is our SAL programs look like this. So I was in a state that will <laughs> remain unnamed. I think our president had a, um, had a rally there recently. Um, but <laughs> uh, I was, shadowing a teacher for a day and they were rolling out an SEL program and she was very proud to actually show this, right? And it's like, oh, here, this is the, our, our SEL program. We have Mood Meter Monday, Trust Building Tuesday, Wishful Wednesday, Thankful Thursday, and you know, 15 minutes for each of these and Feeling Connected Friday. So I was thinking as I'm watching this, like, okay, but what if I wanna feel thankful on Monday? Hmm. It, doesn't, it didn't follow a natural sense of connecting with people. Mm -hmm. SEL can't be relegated to 15 minutes and now we're back at doing the thing we wanna do. So the, the connection to, of emotion to cognition is a really important piece. So culturally responsive practice has always had those two braided together because it is rooted in both social neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience. Unfortunately, the way people talk about culturally responsive thing is it's, it, it's bifurcated. Even it's just the, the relational part, right? We want kids to feel motivated and, you know, has some deficit orientation around it. Or we just think of it as, as kind of dressing up the curriculum, right? We want to honor their cultural identity and have, but the reality is for learning to happen, for cognition to happen, we have to have both that social piece and the emotional piece and the cognition working in tandem. 
So even trauma-informed care should be mindful of how those three systems work and how we're creating that environment in the classroom. It doesn't mean that we shy away from cortisol that stresses. It means it needs to be coupled with dopamine. That is actually why our brains created dopamine, to make us want to do hard things, to not overstress and di get dysregulated when we are actually leveling up our cognition. So the two main things for me is, you know, when we are coming into trying to be culturally responsive and understand collectivism, these two pieces have always worked in tandem, right? That sense of connection. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people have reduced collectivism as, oh, those kids like to work in groups. Well, if you're a person from a collectivist culture, when you're by yourself, you're still collectivist. Why? Because your mental models, your way of orienting yourself to the world comes from those deep roots and that shallow culture, the way you enact those deep roots, right? So what makes you feel like you need to uh, move away from someone or lean into them is that cultural orientation. Here's the thing I want to say. Culture is the software to the brain's hardware. Those three systems are our hardware. What tells me whether I'm connected or not is going to be culturally derived. All right, I'm gonna stop there because you know I could go on and on and on. Um, but hopefully that is you know, kind of a, a larger expansion of culturally responsive practice that has embedded in it kind of that social emotional learning and development. And I would add to that the academic. So I do a lot of stuff with the Aspen Institute and what I really enjoy about them and I sit on one of their advisory committees is they make the connection between social emotional academic development. We call it SEED, right? Because there's a way in which we put academic over here and we put SEL over here. And then everybody's talking about trauma over here. Here's the thing about it. There is a way that you could be talking about trauma in some very racist ways. All Children of color aren't traumatized, right? This is like, I don't know if you remember that show, Everybody Loves Chris back in the day. And, you know, if you don't know it, it's on YouTube. And Miss Morelli was the, the, the teacher. And God bless her heart. She, she, would, she just had a deficit orientation toward the African-American boy. Oh, you must be from a fatherless home. Oh, you must be, it must be, oh, it must be trauma. Are you putting trauma on there? And where are you lifting up joy? Where are you lifting up the dopamine? Where are you lifting up resi resilience from folks that have come from communities that have been marginalized and oppressed? And, and how do you still have joy? Take a look and to see how do we bring some of those things into the classroom and not just make it up over some stereotypical stuff or think we're gonna get SEL out of a box and that's going to make us connected to our students. Wow, deep teaching in just such a short amount of time as well. I am, um, I just continue to be enamored with your work and from the time that we met several years ago when you were leading a book talk about your book and working with the Black Teacher Project on, on helping us get really schooled up on how to appropriately deliver so many of the concepts that, that you write about. Um, folks, start asking some really good questions. We're going to open up the floor for that. And as we're doing that, I am curious. I used to be an assistant principal. I uh, had to only focus on discipline. Broke my spirit. Caused me to do something different for a little while. And um, how can you apply these teachings to um, CRT in the area of discipline, basically? Yeah, I think first is we have to actually have an understanding of the components that make up CRT. Think of CRT as a car, right? We don't think, we say car, but we also know there are wheels, there's a, you know, motor, there are all these other parts that by themselves, you can sit on top of them all on a garage floor, but you're not going nowhere, right? Because there's a synergy that has to happen. So <clears throat> I want people to be thinking about, well, what are the parts that need to actually work together? 
so that one of the things we know is uh, you have to create the container. You have to create the environment that allows that brain to be uh, lowering the cortisol, but have what uh, Kane and Kane, these are two uh, uh, researchers, cognitive ne uh, neuroscientists, and they talk about this idea of relaxed alertness. That we need kids not, you know, blissed out, right? We need a little, a little positive stress, but we need it coupled with this kind of intellectual curiosity. So when we understand that that's what we're going for, then we can start to say, how do we create the social network? How do we create the community of practice? So students can grow into that. Think of classrooms as a dojo. And I don't think that that changes when we think about distance learning. And this is where we can really learn from collectivist cultures that let's just take enslaved African Americans, right? Enslaved Africans knew they could be soul away from each other. There was a way in which there's a spiritual connection that stays intact. There is a way in which you're, you're, you're co continuing to communicate through people, through this idea of um, kind of a, a, a group interaction that holds this knowledge, that passes that on. We have to start to, as educators, widen that so that we, there are more ways we're bringing that in. We have to think about who's not present. There's a way in which we're just kind of, you know, doing this technical thing, but how do we, we create an a, a atmosphere that we see Johnny's not here today. Let's hold a, jot, a, a thought for Johnny, right? Send a, send a note. It doesn't have to be religious. It just has to be, hey, we're holding space for you. That is a collectivist notion because most Western individualistic, you know, community or narratives will put that as, oh, that we don't practice religion. But that's in collectivists, that's not religion, right. right? Understanding the ancestors, that's not religious, but I can't, I've never encountered a collectivist culture, even if it was very different from my own expression of collectivism, that did not have an ancestral orientation mm -hmm. and brought ancestral knowledge, thought about what the ancestors would do, spoke to the ancestors. Now, I'm not saying we need to be doing all that in school, but I, certainly people need to understand where emotional grounding comes from, right? So discipline has to actually match that. And I'm not talking about just restorative practices because sometimes you need something different. If you have racial bullying going, in, uh, going on, I don't want to sit net across from somebody who's racially bullying me. Mm -hmm. if you don't have a discipline code that says that person needs to get their stuff, call their mama and go home or get off the Zoom or whatever we doing, like your hair is on fire, then you're not serious about equity. But if something else is popping off in the classroom, then you should have ways in which students have agreed, this is how we're gonna show up for each other. So Ruler, one of the SEL programs, has a creed or manifesto. If you have not helped students beyond like, oh, we're gonna write norms today. I see a way that we fall into this as kind of this, the technical things. We have norms, well, what the hell are you gonna do when somebody breaks those norms? Because norms are no good until the community has decided we all agree when that happens, this is what's going to go down. And then nobody's going to get upset about it. The problem is we, a lot of our discipline is reactive or it penalizes kids for showing up for who, as their, their natural self. So you really have to interrogate what is the incentive to help kids do better for themselves? Or what is this a sign of? What in the environment is having this reaction on that child? in a way. So there's some investigation stuff that we as leaders have to do, but it's also kind of how are we creating that container for them? And speaking of creating a container, um, we've gotten a few questions about the piece around lifting up joy. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, people are really resonating with that. And yet there's um, a few questions around how are we bringing this joy either into a virtual experience or how are we bringing this joy into what um, one person is naming, Julie is naming, that the joy seems to be taken out of teaching right now. All deaths will be facing forward. There'll be masks on. There'll be no recess. We're going to be staying in the room all day long. Um, well, how are we, we going to lift up joy? In so what this, is where, this is where we look to our ancestors that persevered through the most heinous periods, right? Victor Frankel talks about 
the meaning man's search for meaning and he wrote this book in the ghettos of uh in, in the shadows of the holocaust and he said that there were two type of people that were actually going he could tell who was going to not make it out right that out of those those uh, italian ghettos and those uh polish ghettos the people were being crowded into jewish people were being crowded into he said one that was just not able to accept the the kind of just the physical changes so but there were other people who could see beyond that so now you everything's a remix where can you actually restructure joy so we're going to be on if, if our only avenue is of joy is having things face each other the tables face each other you're gonna have to rethink what makes us joyful is this us being able to play our power song right i i have a strategy where i have folks say what's your collective power strong songs right you you gotta have that playlist that these are you know happy like pharrell's song right so that when you hear it you're just happy right then you have the everything's gonna be all right days going a little sideways but this one just says all right we're gonna shake it off walk it off or but everything's gonna be all right and then there's the the anthem right it ain't no stopping me now right how do you, you have to be able to look beyond the physicality and this to me is where collectivist practices can lead us to that otherwise people would have you know fallen over under the 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 400 years of slavery right how do you look ahead of you and look behind you and you looking at 100 years and be joyful Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying slaves are happy. I'm saying that what you realize is you're a whole human being and you are allowed to have joy and that you will find ways to cultivate that. So part of what we need to do is expand our SEL notion to say, yeah, we're going to have some hard times. Yeah, it's going to be very different and our brains are going to actually be stressed. So what will we do to counter that? Where, what is our joy? And you can survey your kids. What brings you joy when you're feeling a little a little uh, stress. Is that coloring? Do you give every kid a color set so that you just color? We know that there are some repetitive things that start to release the oxytocin. So learn more about oxytocin so that you know how you can release that when you can see, particularly the younger the babies are, the more you're going to have to do that. The older they are, the more you're going to have to give them a little leeway so when that brain cycles down. So absolutely, yeah. Where is the joy? Well, you're going to have to bring it. <laughs> bring your own joy. <laughs> That's right. And I love that you made the connection between the power song. We're getting a lot of comments about that whole concept of the power song. And someone even offered, you know, don't forget about Bill Withers Woo! and Lovely Day, right? You have to have that one. But it made me think about how you, you anchor to a song sometimes in your morning practice. And so the same type of things, folks, we can start to take what creates our results, what brings us joy, what strengthens us, and then how can we bring that into our work? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and here's the thing about it. This is the collective part. Let's, let's, let's squat up on that. Let's actually start to, you know, for teachers, okay, we need to have a Google Doc, <laughs> right? And right. people got walk-up music, right? What's our walk-up music? So when we get into this, we can kind of come together on our own little Zoom room, get ourselves pumped up. I mean, people are going to have to think a little bit outside the box. This is a remix. We, as a human family, have been here before. We need to stop acting like this is new. True. Right? This is where we learn from the, the, the human experience, the ancestral knowledge about what do you do in tough times? Mm -hmm. And so to be able to do that. That is powerful. That is really powerful. And I'm liking that you gave us this neuroscience aspect because um, there's a question in the chat too around, you know, neuroscience and new teacher programs and things like that. But I'm curious because you have seen teachers, schools, districts do book groups uh, uh, with your book in some way. Uh-oh, you got a face going, but... <laughs> I mean, if people wanted to do something with your work that was deeper and collective and supportive, what would you recommend? Well, uh, here's the thing I'm going to say, um, two things. Information is not transformational. So there is a way, and I see this particularly among white educators, like I want to learn about this, yes, but you're also going to have to retrain your amygdala. 
You cannot get culturally responsive from afar. If you are not used to being in communities of color and their cultural ways of being or louder or more, there's more movement and your brain is telling you, you this is dangerous because now your amygdala is like, well, that's not how we do. You're the only one of the few. And you can't train your amygdala to calm itself down, to rewire itself. No amount of reading that book when you're in the environment with those children. And here's this thing that we have. We call, have this thing called neuroception. This is like the coolest part of that polyvagal nerve in our stomach is it can read emotions up to 20 to 30 seconds before you register it consciously. Hmm. This is why we have hair on our neck. This is why stand up on your neck when we have a situation going on. You can't, like what's going on? It is reading the emotions of the room. This is why you can walk in the room and nobody's saying anything. And you can say, it's tense in here. That's neuroception. Children have it in spades. We have a tendency through our rational brain to tap it down. So they sess you out pretty quickly. So if you're just reading, like I've learned some techniques, this is not a technical thing. You got to first humanize your relationships. And if you are not used to being in communities of color, where you're just being, not trying to lead nothing, not trying to say nothing, not trying to be down or be woke, but just be and not feel tripped out, there is no way you reading the book is going to lead to anything. So I think it's a both and. Yes, Ferrari says we have conceptual understanding that leads to action and we step back and reflect to say what needs to change, what needs to evolve, what needs to iterate. And we go round and round. He called that praxis. So the book is just the first part of praxis. What's the conceptual understanding of this? That's why I put the ready for rigor frame together. Oh, these are the four components. Oh, here it is. See, there's a way in which people are talking about anti-racist education as if these are all interchangeable. You have to be an anti-racist educator to be on the road to being a culturally responsive one, on the road to being an abolitionist teacher. That's all a state of becoming. Yes. And if you don't understand what it takes to move to the next level, because whatever you get, this is the hero's journey. There's the call to adventure. And then you're going to have to leave the known world. Then you're going to have to do a new thing. And if you haven't prepared your mind and that amygdala to do a new thing, you're just going to go back to the default. And you're going to pick a couple of strategies and then want to call yourself culturally responsive. Those kids sess you out. Mic drop. I don't even know where to really go. <laughs> Get me wound up, girl. I see. I see. All right. So someone, Carol Johnson, teaching is 80% white. How do I keep it together when I see so much white savior behavior? Absolutely. And this is actually, you know, SNL back in the day had a, a, a skit. I think it's still on, on YouTube, white teacher right? This idea, though, is that's part of your journey. We all have a journey. As an African-American teacher, if I have a lot of Latino students and that's not my thing, then I need to learn about that because that collectivism shows up differently. When I go to Juno and I know that uh, Alaska Native culture is a particular way, I have to make adjustments. And it's not a matter of be losing part of myself, is I now am bicultural. I am now tricultural. And I can move in and out of that. We do it all the time. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I see is white teachers actually don't do that. Here's my thing. You ain't gonna be, there's no PD for this. If you're sitting waiting for your school to do a PD, then you know you are not down for equity. Because most people of color are already spending their own time to not only study white folk and, wh and white supremacy culture, listen, they got a PhD in it and they are swapping notes. Most white people will not spend their leisure time on this. That is the truth. That is the and truth. And so to the reality is, if you don't make it your own study, meaning not just reading a book, but literally like, I need to go out and see that. So I'm running a 21 day challenge in my uh, Facebook group. And that's what we call it. 21 day racial literacy challenge. So the first is three weeks. First week is, do you know yourself? Not in a racial way, but if you can't map where you are, who you are, you don't know what triggers you. You don't know why you're responding to that student that way. You can't widen your aperture to say, oh, here's my way of doing it, and there's another way I can add. But the, a lot of white educators don't do that piece. 
right? This is page 57 to 59 in the book. And I literally list some things that help people do that excavation. Then there's the racial literacy. It's not always inside work, right? You need, there's some outside work you need to do too. And that means, do you understand how we have structural racialization that continues to churn out racialized outcomes? Why is it a disproportionate number of police uh, are killing unarmed black men. Because the fact is that Floyd, uh, George Floyd, that wasn't new. People have been saying that. Did you actually need to see him die on TV to understand that? But there are the 80%, that 85% of white teachers, the majority of them have no understanding of racial literacy. Why do we have Confederate statues? A lot of white people don't know that those statues were never put up at the end of the Civil War. They were put up almost 50 years later at the, to, to undermine Reconstruction when that pseudo form of slavery, Jim Crow, was instituted. And it was a reminder to all Black people and Indigenous people, this is how, who we are and this is how we're going to roll. So people don't know that history. Because if you knew that history, you'd understand why certain things happen the way they do. Reading, we had illiteracy laws. And those illiteracy laws, right? I say one of the biggest things as to why we have these achievement gaps and opportunity gaps is we underdevelop the cognitive capacity of black and brown children. You just, all you gotta do is step back and see it. it starts to happen with reading. Historically, we've had illiteracy laws. Those anti-literacy laws weren't for black and brown people. You just lost your life, lost your hand, lost your tongue. That, those were for white people because whiteness was turned into a currency at Bacon's Rebellion. And now what the threat was, if you actually undermine white supremacy culture by teaching black and brown people how to read, you're not down with the pack <laughs> and we will take your whiteness from you. Mm -hmm. This is some deep stuff and it's all there in the book. Here, I'm gonna throw a book up that I literally have sitting on my thing. This is a great one, Birth of a White Nation. Yes right? The Invention of White People and Its Relevance Today. Excellent book. Thin, very accessible. Here's another one, The Color of Law. So if you don't understand whiteness as currency, it was codified. This is why white people, black people could not testify against white people, and it wasn't limited to in courtrooms, right? So my point to you is you can't even begin to be culturally responsive if you don't have racial literacy because you don't understand why this is happening. And then the myth of meritocracy takes over. Then I don't know why those parents are doing, and the parents came through the same broken racist system. And we blame an parent. But that's part of what I call the four horsemen of deficit ideology. We don't have time to go into it because you know I would just go on and on. But my point to you is that 80%, 85% of white teachers, we need other white teachers. This is not on the backs of black and brown educators. White people, this is, white people set up white supremacy. Only white people can dismantle it. Mm -hmm. So this idea of looking to people of color, you can actually say, okay, help me with that racial literacy part, but I need to go back over here and do something about that. So we have it a little, a little flipped around, right? So the reality is we can start changing things in our schools today. We could dismantle this across society today. So this is back to the mindfulness. If we were really humanizing relationships, if we were really mindful of the sharing and not holding on to whiteness as currency and actually perpetuating that in our schools. And I'm not saying any teacher goes in to be white supremacist. I'm saying you are not recognizing. And those of us that drink the education Kool-Aid, right? Same thing with black and brown policemen. We then are in the system. We are enacting that as well. And I'm, I'm really appreciating right that you have these books there. I mean, much to your point again, that the people of color who are taking this very seriously and even not people of color who are, who are doing the work of, of not just reading up, but also doing the embodiment piece. That's it's right. definitely a both and. We have to have the embodiment along with the information, along with the dialogue. How are we normalizing race in our conversations? And I think that that, um, you know, as badly as people want to 
get culturally responsive teaching and the brain and other books like it if we don't normalize the conversation of, of all the juiciness that this book even brings up for us because we can't get past the race part that we can't even fully apply being more rigorous with our students. Absolutely. And this is the way in which it actually happens because we'll continue to blame our students. Even though we can see the grit and the growth mindset ideology, even progressive white educators in charter schools and other alternative settings, they are still part of the mechanisms that, and we hear some of those things in terms of, you know, this is for the good of the kids, as to your point about the white savior, right? And then some people of color fall into that. Right, I made it so yeah, that we all have our ways in which that supremacy culture has distorted our ability to support students. Right, and, and we have to be willing to let go of some of those things. This is where I think we start with mindfulness. We start with, I am going to be compassionate, self-compassionate, right? When you know better, you do better. So I'm not beating myself up over any guilt. I mean, you have to have a practice that says it is okay to grow. It is okay to grieve. If I only, I can't tell you the number of emails I get where teachers are like, if I only had this, oh, I shudder to think what I did to my students. Mm -hmm. And I, all I can offer is when you know better, you do better. Yeah. Right? Brene Brown talks about this. You cannot allow that shame because it becomes toxic, then you really cannot grow. Because now you're trying to prove I'm not that racist person. I don't believe that. So now we hear people like, I'm colorblind, I love all humans. I mean, it, and what you're not doing is acknowledging there's a system that's killing black and brown men, that's marginalized black and, black and brown children, that's children still living in cages. Because we have this notion that if you speak Spanish, you're less than, and somehow you need to be corralled, and nobody's hair is on fire but those children that are still on the border in a cage. Yes. On fire. <laughs> like, not that, take something down. Folks are talking about statues? Hello? Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Thank you. You are so welcome. Attend the Academy of Zaretta Hammond for the hour. Thank you. Um, I, I just appreciate you making space because like anybody that knows me knows, right, I get cranked up. I have deemed myself the guardian at litem for all children that have been historically marginalized, right? I'm not in any kind of uh, camp for anything. I'm an agnostic on curricular approaches. Is it growing the brain power of that child? And I will, uh, that is my mission. That is my God-given, driven mission. And yes, I get a little worked up about it sometimes. So I appreciate you all making a little space and let me show up in my full self. Well, someone said the Tony, Emmy, and Oscar goes to <laughs> Mrs. Loretta Hammond. So, I mean, really, you just brought it and the energy and the concepts and not, I don't want phrases, cheapens it. That's not what I mean, but you gave us rich language that um, is food for thought and even uh, that we can use to apply as, as we enter this new paradigm, because we are in a new paradigm. And I love that you're not calling it the reset, but it's the remix. And we think about the remix, that's even joy to it because, Absolutely. you know, D-Nice, the remix is all of it. We're going to mix it all up and we're going to make Absolutely. some good out of this. Absolutely. And um, anything else before we close out on our end? Anything you want to share? Any last words you oh, want to say? You know, just, you know, follow me on Instagram. I'm trying to level up my IG game. Um, on Twitter, I'm always there. I try to pop in a couple of times a week. You know, that's like a water hose, you know, drinking from a water hose, but I love me some Twitter. Um, and yeah, I, th those are the places right now and continuing just for us to be in community, you know, all of us doing the best we can. And I'd say whatever you choose to do to start to embody this, as you said, is to start small. Right. Mm -hmm. Think about what's my lead domino because you can't be everywhere. All you can't do all the things. So look at what's the one high leverage thing. What do you need to keep doing because it is having a positive result? What do you need to stop doing because it's either having no result and siphoning your energy is actually having a negative result. Then think about what you need to start doing. I think we are not mindful enough mm -hmm. to step back to see what we need to keep 
to keep doing. We're not mindful enough to see, I actually need to stop doing that. Maybe because it's not only that it's hurting, but it, we've outgrown it. That's right. That's and, right. and mindfulness is about knowing when it is ready to grow. Knowing the snake knows when it's time to shed its skin. The hermit crab knows when it's time to get a new shell. And that little hermit crab, for a few minutes, for the time that it's between one shell and the next, is vulnerable. It feels vulnerable. feels like it's falling apart. But you're, that breakdown is actually just the setup for the breakthrough. That's right. And that's how we're going to get better. That's how we're, our children are actually going to get the education they deserve. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tell us your website address one more time so people can sign up for your. Yeah. So you can sign up for my newsletter. It is uh, crtinthebrain.com. There's a study guide that goes with the book if you're interested in that. But I'm always doing things kind of, you know, for my, for my folks in my community. So definitely get on the, um, on the newsletter and we'll be um, on Instagram a little more. Right now I've got a, a Facebook group, but we, we will be transitioning that a little bit. I know anybody that's in that Facebook, <laughs> Facebook group is like, what? <laughs> Hello, <laughs> new news. Um, so uh, we'll find some other spaces, but definitely I will be on Instagram. So definitely find me there. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to make a few announcements and we'll officially Absolutely. close out because people were filling up their Amazon carts while you were speaking, reading us all those great titles. Uh, folks, That's don't right. forget. That's to right. That's not good. How many times did the sister talk about mindfulness and education? So this is a key tool for you to add to your other reading as well. So please consider ordering that book. Um, visit Cosm's website, Educating Mindfully, to sign up for the Commit to 1%, which is 10 minutes of your waking hours and how you can be more mindful. Of course, you can start a Cosm practice group in your sphere of influence just by uh, working on how can we bring mindfulness and education together and get a support group going, please consider donating regularly and generously. We have um, some programs that are launching this month where proceeds are going to COSM as part of the registration. One of those is Racial Healing Allies that came out of a partnership from COSM. And so the second cohort is launching on August 5th. So Racial Healing Allies, you can Google that. It'll take you to my site to be sure to register if you want to engage in mindful allyship, a heartfelt approach to racial healing. So get our consciousness going in that direction. And our guests on August 3rd will be Cosm's own Linda Ryden, who is the creator of the Peace of Mind program, which is a cutting edge combination of mindfulness, SEL, neuroscience and conflict resolution. Uh, Zaretta Hammond is one of her favorite people. So she'll be uh, citing some of her work as well. She's a full-time peace teacher at Lafayette Elementary School in Washington, DC, where she teaches peace classes to more than 700 children every week. She's also in Racial Healing Allies and plans to just share about all the intersectionality of um, her awakening to being more equitable as a teacher what this also means for white women who are leading the work in mindfulness with kids of color and uh, being a culturally responsive teacher. And so she has a lot to share with us in August. So we hope that you make it on August 3rd. Registration will open for that in a few days. And whoo, this has been so rich. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Zaretta. We really appreciate you giving your time today. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Thank you for the two of you for holding space for these kinds of conversations. Really appreciate that.